This is A Day in the Half-Life. I'm Aaliyah Kovner, and in this episode, we're going to talk about microelectronics. What is microelectronics? Uh, every time you use your cell phone or you open up your computer to pay your bills, you're using microelectronics. That is Ramesh, a professor of physics and materials science at UC Berkeley and a faculty senior scientist at Berkeley Lab in the energy sciences area. They have various names. Some people call them chips. Uh, some people call them microprocessors. And they are electronics-based components. They think for us. They do logic operations for us. They store information. But all of them are doing some things to better the humankind. They're making our life better. And of course, underneath that, there is a whole lot of engineering, there's a whole lot of materials, and at the, at the core of it, a whole lot of physics. Right, I think we'd be hard pressed to think of something that doesn't involve microelectronics. And that's my other guest, Sinead Griffin. Sinead is a staff scientist in the Materials Science Division and in the Molecular Foundry, also at Berkeley Lab. So it is the computer that helps us figure out, you know, what, what we're going to, how we're going to schedule our next doctor's appointment. Everything that has a computer inside it relies on microelectronics. And in this increasing time where we're uh, more focusing on Internet of Things, having smart homes, having even our car systems that are now computer based, we're going to be increasingly reliant on microelectronics to, to navigate the world and to also increase the quality of life for day-to-day for -day life as well. So let's start at the beginning. I looked up examples of famous electronics from long ago for comparison, and the Apollo guidance computer which is the computer that allowed the Apollo 11 crew to navigate to and from the moon, had the equivalent of 0.004 megabytes of editable memory, and it was two feet long, about one foot high, and it weighed 70 pounds. Um, these days, as you both know, memory chips can be smaller than one square inch and store a terabyte of memory. So when and where did the microelectronics revolution begin? Great question. Great question. Let's begin at the beginning. <laughs> uh, in, in, in many instances, microelectronics started at Bell Labs with a few physicists, all of them are Nobel, were all Nobel laureates, uh, asking the question, how do I understand the fundamental properties of matter? Understand the fundamental problem. You have some insights on it being a, a theoretical physicist. Right, yeah. So it was John Bardeen who first was really thinking about how we move charges around in a new type of material at the time, which is called a semiconductor. So these are materials that are somewhere in between being a, a good metal and a good insulator. So that that's kind of sounds like it might be contradictory. So an insulator is something where charge doesn't move freely and a metal is one that does. Um, and so it, it, they were really interested in, in the fundamental physics of these types of systems. They had no idea that this would be so, uh, so important for the next technological revolution. They were really just scratching their heads and figuring out, well, these are really interesting materials. Let's try and figure out how they work. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, like Sinead said, this started with people just asking simple science questions. This is uh, winding the clock back to the late 40s, early 50s in, in the research environments of places like Bell Labs or IBM's TJ Watson or the Xerox PARC research centers. And uh, to a large extent, the national labs, with people just asking simple science questions. Hmm, how do I understand the world around us? Okay. But it soon was clear that this transistor or a transferring of a resistor or a, a tunable resistor, that's really what it is. So it's a material whose resistance can be changed significantly by several orders of magnitude, actually, by applying an electric field to it. And that was the birthplace and the genesis of the notion of a transistor. Now, uh, fast forward from Bell Labs in the early 50s, 
uh, to the birth of Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. Silicon Valley did not exist in the 50s. It was just about ready to be germinated. What happened was there was a huge push to take these ideas and turn them into uh, technologies that could be productized and sold everywhere. This led to the boom in venture capitalism in Silicon Valley. And one of the earliest companies was Fairchild Semiconductor, which again was founded by a few people who left Bell Labs and who came to the Bay Area to start thinking about how to productize these ideas. Uh, some of them uh, then subsequently left to form the company that we know today as Intel. And so there was this whole bunch of, of companies that uh, mushroomed up all the way into the 80s uh, when people were using these transistors in a very complicated form. One of the big stepping stones in this was the notion of an integrated circuit. So typically you don't do much with a single transistor. You need a whole bunch of transistors, millions or billions of these transistors working together, both to store information and to do logic operations. So the, the, the advent of the integrated circuit was an important stepping stone. So one term I hear a lot when researching microelectronics or reading news about this field is Moore's Law. Can you tell me what this means and how it relates to electronics industry? Sure. So um, Moore is, is named after Gordon Moore, um, who was an electronic engineer. And in the 60s, he, he noticed that the size of the number of transistors that could fit uh, was actually increasing every year and a half. So he had several data points. And he fit a line to the data points and made this prediction that the, the, the transistor scaling would follow this law. So I think it was originally um, doubling every other year, but I think it's 1.5 is now, is now um, where, where that, that scaling law behaves. Right. It turns out uh, this is not a fundamental law of nature, but it was more of a techno-economic law. It's exactly like building a high-rise apartment. The more uh, smaller the, you know, the apartment is, the more number of apartments that you can build in a given space. So if your chip size is a one by one centimeter, and if each of these transistors shrinks by 50%, you can build more transistors uh, into the chip. And that meant that you can make different kinds of products. That's where the economic part of it. So this was really a prophecy, a self-fulfilling prophecy that Gordon Moore and the folks in the industry were saying. Gordon Moore, of course, one of the co-founders of Intel, they were, they were pushing it and they were trying to use it as a way to push the engineers to innovate some more. Now, this Moore's Law, of course, has been propagated for almost 50 years. And today, those length scales are not microns, but nanometers. Perhaps we should define length scale a little bit more. Um, it's the critical dimension. What is uh, uh, the dimension of a certain object on the chip? In this case, it's a dimension, a lateral dimension of the wire that carries the current back and forth. And in olden days, in the 60s and the 70s, they used to be of the order of several micrometers. And people said, okay, I can shrink it by 50%. I would still be okay. Today, it is not micrometers, it's nanometers. And more importantly, it is of the order of a few nanometers, which means we are reaching the limits of how finely you can cut up the transistor. And this is essentially a, a, a stumbling block or it's a, it's a limiting function on Moore's law. That also therefore says, how does one deal with the next generation where I cannot shrink anymore? Right, yeah. So as we come to this limit, as we come to the limit where we're in the nanometers range, where we're really talking about tens of atoms thick, at that stage, there's not a lot more clever engineering or fabrication can do. Right. We really need to fundamentally rethink what the constituents of these types of materials are and how we can increase their efficiency rather than just make them smaller and smaller and smaller. So we need to start thinking about new physics. We need to start thinking entirely, rethinking about what are the fundamental components about how these, how these chips work and how can we actually pack more density 
into these systems without just reducing the sizes of the individual components anymore. Sinead, you brought up a very, very important point. In the 60s, all the way up to maybe 2010, the focus was on reducing that, that dimension and ergo to follow Moore's law or to fulfill Moore's prophecy. Things worked very well, but in parallel, these chips were consuming a lot of energy. Indeed, uh, there are predictions, uh, both from Lawrence Berkeley Lab and other agencies, the Semiconductor Research Corporation, for example. They have predicted that if we don't do anything to the total amount of energy that's consumed in these electronic components, by 2030, at least a quarter of the total worldwide energy could be spent in electronics. That's a staggering number. Today, it's about 5 to 6%. And so we are not paying much attention. But if we let this go with machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of this macro scale phenomena, we could get to a point where a significant amount of our energy is spent in electronics. And therefore, there is now this realization that one needs to not only think about defining smaller dimensions, but one also needs to reduce the energy consumption in this process i.e. make it very energy efficient. And this is where Sinead was talking about new physics, new materials coming in. Yeah, so that brings in a whole new challenge to what the fundamental physics and the fundamental materials that these types of transistors rely on. Um, so we do have some ideas about how to do this. Um, one of the, uh, and, and to bring it down to really fundamental science, one of the ways we can increase how these transistors work is by including something called spin. Uh, so usual transistors rely on a property of the electron called its charge, and the charge can be moved by electric fields. However, if we include the spin degree of freedom, we can also think about magnetism and, and shuttling around these electrons using magnetic fields. However, that process requires a lot of energy. So we, we're going to ask a different question. Well, what if we can move this spin around with electric fields? So this brings us to the challenge of designing new types of transistors where we can control the spin with electric fields rather than with magnetic fields, which is a much more energy efficient process. And these, this, isn't, this isn't a dream. These materials do exist. These, these, these properties do exist in real materials. So thank you both. That just dovetailed perfectly with, with my next question, which is, you know, what are the problems with the microelectronic industry today? Because as you're both just discussing, you know, the revolutions of the past enabled huge advances in personal electronics and in research-based uh, electronic tools. So Sinead, you described a little bit about the work you're trying to do in this domain to improve microelectronics. Ramesh, what are the research community and computer industry doing to take microelectronics beyond Moore's law? Yeah, that's a great question, Alia. So um, it's like uh, uh, any other large complex system. All the components of that system have to come together. If you want to have a great uh, uh, symphony, each of the musicians has to come together uh, in, in unison to make it work. That's true for microelectronics too. And therefore, there is a whole range of translational science that needs to be done, all the way from the fundamental science that places like LBL are so good at. From there, to get to a product, there are six degrees of separation. Each one of those separation steps have to be overcome. For example, in the case of the materials that Sinead is talking about, one has to be able to put them down on a large wafer. And today's state of the art is a 300 millimeter, a 12 inch wafer. And that's what people like Intel uh, are working on. So these materials have to be put down on those kinds of platforms. That really means that there needs to be synthesis processes. Then the next question is, does this new device function like the way we think it should? Uh, the physics says it should function, but does it really function, which is really uh, an issue of measuring these systems. Then the ultimate part of this is, does it function reliably? I mean, does it function for 10 years? Does it store the information? So degradation mechanisms are a very key part. 
And then the last part of it, you go from science to technology to markets. The last part of it is how costly or how cheap is this product? How competitive is it with other technologies that are showing up in the marketplace? And is there a different way to solve this problem? All of these things are coming together at the end where you as the consumer or the customer, you don't want to pay any more than what you need to to get the services or the product that you want. So those are the various steps that a company like Intel will have to, to face taking a new idea, a new concept, like manipulating spins with an electric field all the way into a real product. Yeah, and uh, the last point you bring up about cost is actually something that can influence us from the very beginning. So when we are designing these types of materials, we can ensure that we don't include very rare costly elements in the types of materials that we're, we're, we're proposing. So even the very end process of market can actually influence us from the fundamental materials design as well. That's really cool to hear just because, I mean, I, I learned all about energy storage in a previous episode and one huge issue with lithium ion batteries, which the world is now very dependent on, is the cobalt and nickel mining. So it's very cool to hear that you're sort of already considering that before these next generation microchips are born. And I also have been loving hearing about how many different fields of expertise come into both of these. And that's always a great theme for Berkeley Lab, which is all about team science. So I would also love to hear just about how you both collaborate with other groups and how, how multidisciplinary this work really is. Great point, great point, Alia. So let's, let's pick up on that thread. Indeed, this whole business of microelectronics, it spans the entire spectrum. We can start with physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics, to the engineering sciences, through material science, into electrical engineering, and then pass that to computer science and computer engineering. And it's a huge area of not only research, but business. Globally, it's about a $500 billion industry, growing at about 18% every year. And therefore, the business uh, aspects of it are, are a key component. Now, uh, um, one of the things that we are innovating on, this is based on a recent program that the Department of Energy has funded us on, is called co-design. You know, in the past, 30 years ago, people who did the materials and physics, uh, typically in the universities or the national labs, they worked in their own framework, but they didn't necessarily talk to the people who were making the devices. And the people who made the devices perhaps did not talk to the people who were doing the algorithms and everything. But then we said, hey, would it not be better if we brought all of them together to work under the same roof? And this is the, the notion of co-design where all of the components, all of the competencies come together to solve a big problem. And indeed our co-design platform is called Atoms to Architecture. You know, someone like Sinead, who is a theorist who works on, on the fundamental physics of these new materials. Somebody like myself, where I make materials and probe their properties. Uh, I am taking all the, the theoretical knowledge from Sinead, and I'm trying to make these materials and probe their properties. But then there are other parts of our team where they're building circuits out of it. And they're even higher. Uh, one of our colleagues is looking at how the, the notion of artificial intelligence can be used to feed back into designing a better uh, chip for the future. So the notion of a core design is a confluence of all the disciplines, and this is becoming more and more popular. Yeah, I could probably give a concrete example of how that works at LBL. Um, and I'm going to talk about the theory since that's the part I'm most familiar with. So. Uh, my group looks really how atoms can be combined to give you new types of physics. So we're really in that nanoscale uh, length scale when we're talking about the fundamental physics of these materials. And typically, we wouldn't really discuss much with people who, who design devices. That's just not normally a conversation that happens. Um, they're usually sitting over in a different department, electronic engineering or computer science somewhere else. Um, but what, what this program we have at LBL is doing is, is forcing us to talk to colleagues that maybe we wouldn't talk science with before. <laughs> so, for example, in, in the microelectronics, we're calculating the, the properties of these materials. We're understanding how to control their behavior. And then we're giving the 
uh, the quantities and the properties that we're calculating from an atomic scale up one level in the length scales. So we're giving the properties of these materials um, to our colleagues in the computational sciences division who can do larger scale simulations um, of different types of features, different types of, of um, combinations of, and geometries of materials to figure out then how these specific materials in, uh, interact with each other and perform in, in small devices. And then following that, so following this kind of small device simulation, then they're going to feed it into the architecture. So we really have this atoms to architecture si simulation that can then hopefully do the reverse as well. So we can do the reverse project where, you know, the architecture people say, hey, this will really improve the performance if you can make this modification and that modification. So one thing I'm curious about is you both um, you both have different focus areas and yet you kind of overlap and you work together on this program. But I'd just like to hear a little bit about what um, kind of a normal day in the lab or a day at work is like for each of you when you're not you know teaching students or appearing on a podcast. Um, what does your like hands-on work look like? Sure. So we we use theory and um, computational techniques to understand and predict new materials and, and new types of physical phenomena. Um, so there is a lot of of figuring out different equations, uh, you know, writing things, pencil and paperwork, right, working things mm -hmm. out on blackboards, and then doing a lot of uh, computational simulations as well. So uh, a lot of the work is either on the computer or on pencil and paper when we're actually figuring out the equations and figuring out how these systems work. Um, but of course, a big part of it is is, is, is discussing with colleagues. So meeting and, and figuring out um, where our mistakes are, how to interpret results and, and meeting with collaborators. So meeting with people like Ramesh who are physically making and characterizing uh, and understanding these materials in, in the actual laboratory rather than inside our computers. That sounds very cool, and it sounds like your work is is a little bit more, as you said, pencil and paper, a little more um, cerebral. And I'm wondering, Ramesh, I can picture you in a uh, clean room suit, bunny suit, gloves, goggles, everything. Are you ever going into a fabrication room like that? Is that part of your day to day? For Ramesh personally, that was many moons ago, and I'm, not, <laughs> I'm a professor, and many professors don't actually go to the lab to make the things. A while ago. <laughs> 15 years ago, I used to do this, uh, but my students probably will not let me into the lab because I could be very <laughs> dangerous. But uh, we are indeed, like Sinead mentioned, we are, we are experimentalists, which means we make the materials. But we have the power to make these materials by precisely putting one atom at a time. You know, we can make these uh, very, very perfect quality materials. Indeed, that's a big forte for us in terms of making model systems, understanding uh, at the core what the properties look like. And that's how we kind of tag team with Sinead, who is a theorist. She makes the predictions, we make the materials, and we ask, do these match up? Are there differences? And that, so there's a lot of back and forth discussion. Sometimes they're very intense discussions because we are all very animated science people. <laughs> then the next part of it is we have to go do the measurements of these and that requires capabilities like the National Center for Microscopy or the Advanced Light Source where you can do some of the most sophisticated measurements to probe the properties of these kinds of new materials that we make. What does creating a sample um actually look like? I'm, I mean, for me, I can't even really picture what kind of machines would be involved or, you know, what is involved in that process. If, if possible, could you describe that? Yeah. So uh, very simply, it's like making a sandwich. <laughs> and you can make as, as complicated a sandwich and literally it is the same, but it, there is a parallel universe. It looks very much like making a sandwich. Now let's go through the process. You take a piece of bread. For us, that piece of bread is called a substrate. That's typically a silicon wafer. Okay. And you stick it on a surface. Uh, typically, I don't like a cold sandwich. I, I like a hot <laughs> sandwich. So I toast uh, my bread. And instead, <laughs> on a substrate, we heat it up to high temperatures because that's how you make the right kind of material. 
So you have the bread that's toasted, you put the first piece of cheese. That could be one of the layers in the material which we would evaporate. Uh, cheese, you don't evaporate, you just put it on from, uh, from the slice. Uh, for us, we would evaporate. But the key difference would be the cheese is macroscopic. You know, it's a few millimeter thick slice. In our case, it's one atom one atom at a time. And therefore, we can basically place these atoms. We have uh, techniques that we call molecular beam epitaxy. And each of those looks like a heavy technical word, and they are. Uh, we can take atomic beams uh, and spray them. You can think of it as spray painting, but the atomic scale. And you can position the atoms on a surface almost completely, precisely. And then you, you say, okay, I've built one layer. I put the cheese down, I now put a piece of tomato on it. And the piece of tomato is my active layer, the one which I want to manipulate. And I can, I can come back with a technique uh, like these deposition techniques, a chemical vapor uh, based approach or a physical vapor approach and put down the layer atom by atom. And in doing so, we can essentially control the properties at the atomic scale. I think that that analogy is great as well as describing the role of theory. So in theory, we can see, is it better to put down the cheese or the tomato first? Or maybe we need to add some pickle in there to make it a full That's sandwich. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But theory will also tell you what is the, the, the right kind of uh, cheese and what is the uh, right thickness of the tomato uh, that gives you the best sandwich. And eat no sandwich, no uh, uh, two sandwiches are made the same. And uh, you're right, Sinead, the theory is, is that, that very important design glue that makes it all come together. The production process for these new microelectronics sounds really interesting. And you're thinking about new materials to use for them. But how do you decide what kind of cheese to use? Or how do you figure out what the best new tomato <laughs> is that the world needs, but they've never had yet? How, how do you do that? Sure. So so for the particular type of material that we're interested in, these, these are called multiferroics or magnetoelectrics. Um, they're actually really rare. Uh, so they they were first uh, measured and discovered, you know, a few decades ago, but really were serendipitously discovered until recently. So it was really on this sort of Edisonian case by case basis where we accidentally stumble across a material that has these properties and then we try and understand why it's working. Um, and actually that led to my, my PhD advisor, Nicholas Walden, actually wrote a paper in 2000 that explained why these are so rare. Um, so the types of, of chemical properties and chemical motifs that you need for something to have these types of functionalities is actually really rarely occurring in the same materials class. Um, however, recently we've been able to rethink the materials discovery uh, process um, with the advances of large materials databases like the materials project. So in, in the materials project, we've got over 100,000 inorganic crystals. And rather than, you know, going through a uh, Ramesh growing through each material on a case by case basis, I don't know how long it would take him to do 100,000 materials. He'd probably need a few more grad students. Um, a few more rather... lifetimes. Like... <laughs> <laughs> um, so rather than, than doing it on this case by case basis, we can actually search these large databases for specific properties and constraints to allow us to make new predictions of materials that have the properties that we want. So it's really uh, going through this, this materials discovery process in a whole new way by starting off with a very large selection of materials and then being able to down select and pinpoint the exact ones that we need for these types of applications. Is this platform available to uh, scientists outside of Berkeley Lab? Yes, so it's it's free and openly available. So mm -hmm. www.materialsproject.org will get you there. There's also an API, so you can make API requests as well um, of the Materials Project also. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, you can now, the computers are so powerful uh, that they were not so 20 years ago. They're so powerful then you can basically design everything in your computer, including the chip and the computer itself. They are so powerful. And so you can say, hmm, 
hey, computer, tell me, what's the best way to, to go about discovering this? And the computer will go through, look at 100,000 different uh, uh, compounds and say, hey, look, focus on these 10. This is the best chance that, that you got to meet your own specs that you want to meet. Then you go back to the experimental and say, guys, I think this is going to work if you pick this chemical species, mix it this way, and bingo, you got a great sandwich. You know? And this is really the power of the materials project that Sinead is involved in, that you now have completely transformed materials discovery. Are any of these multiferroic materials that you're working with, are any of them naturally occurring or were was the class of material in itself kind of designed in a lab? So many of them are found naturally occurring, um, but the, the ones with the best properties generally aren't. So they generally require some sort of modification, whether that is thinning them down to being only a few layers thick and stacking them into sandwiches, or maybe introducing some new element into the material to enhance one of the properties. Right. Uh, actually, one of the systems, uh, we always make a joke out of it, uh, that Sinead, myself, and uh, Nicholas Spalden, who's involved in our project as well, is, is made out of bismuth iron and oxygen, is bismuth iron oxide. And we joke that if you have a stomachache, you can take some bismuth iron oxide. It's like Pepto-Bismol, you know. I love, uh, I love bismuth. Yeah. yeah. I oh, rely on that stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they have to be put into a certain state. And so you have to constrain them in a way that you get the best performance out of them. That's where you transition from fundamental physics to engineering, because you're you're now saying, I need to meet certain specifications, not just know if it is a multi or not. So I'm so curious now, um, you know, you're actively working on designing new chips that have n new materials with new properties, you know, going beyond the traditional semiconductor materials that we use today. But once you have a chip like that, um, is this going to be something that could kind of be dropped in in place where traditional microelectronics are now? Or would it sort of necessitate a change in the larger systems as well? Like, can you just swap it out or is it going to be more complicated than that? Alia, this is a great question. So uh, to give our uh, listeners a perspective, it turns out that these microelectronic chips have to be made under very, very clean conditions. And therefore, you will hear from people that it takes $20 billion to build one of these factories. Hmm. So the fab managers in the microelectronics will not let strange materials come in. And therefore, this is a really important issue. And I, I always give this example. If you're a vegetarian for some reason, right, you don't want somebody to come into your kitchen and cook chicken because that will mess up. It's not vegetarian. Similarly, fab managers like their kitchens to be very clean because their livelihood depends on it. So because of the cost involved, uh, now tens of billions of dollars, it is not a trivial thing to bring in new materials. So there's a lot of thinking, a lot of pre-testing that happens before you can take some of the exotic new materials that we are talking about into a fab. Having said that, we know that the fabs have also become more and more progressive in their thinking. They are more accepting of new materials that 20 years ago, they would not. And the prime reason, again, is the fact that they're ending, they're coming to the end of Moore's law. They need more innovation, which will be enabled by new materials. So yes, in principle, uh, there are companies that I know of who are doing this already, who are taking new materials, complex materials, and dropping it into a standard silicon-based platform. And would the resulting um, chips be ready to swap into today's electronics, like say a, a phone, or would the phone have to be re-engineered to accommodate that new technology? Yeah, great question. Again, most of them, most of them are drop-in in the sense the system, which is the phone or your communication system or your computing system is already there. And so they will be, 
a minimal amount of, uh, of disruption to the existing system. Now, having said that, imagine that you came up with a completely new architecture, the neuromorphic architecture. That may require a complete re-engineering of the system. But that's how progress is made anyway. We make big discoveries at the fundamental level, and one of them, a few of them, completely change the landscape all the way to the system level. These neuromorphic uh, devices are heavily inspired by how our brain works. Oh. Um, so we already know that our brain does a lot of computations very quickly and with very, very efficient use of energy as well. Our, our brains don't heat up too much when we're doing these computations. <laughs> um, and so a lot of the next generation microelectronics are using this inspiration of uh, how brains compute and, and move and process information to design the next generation of, of microelectronics as well. So that's where the neuromorphic comes from. It's, it's mm -hmm. this kind of brain inspired um, mm -hmm. uh, circuits. So Sinead, I've heard that you have some very interesting uh, projects in the works for using these new and improved microelectronics for, for new areas of research. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. So um, I'll start off with how I got interested in, in, in these types of materials in the first place. And it wasn't yes. to solve the energy challenge in microelectronics, I will be honest. <laughs> um, it was because I, I saw pictures of these materials, so images that have been taken by a, an experimental collaborator, uh, Manfred Fiebig, who's at the um, Etahan Zurich in Switzerland. And, and these were really cool images of these black and white swirling domains. And so domains are areas of the material that have similar properties. And, and these types of materials form domains and form these nice, uh, they kind of look like psychedelic 60s types of pictures with these swirls. <laughs> but at the time, they didn't know why these patterns were forming that the way they were. Um, but I had previously done work on cosmic string formation in the early universe. So during the Big Bang, right after the Big Bang, the universe had lots of phase transitions as it cooled. And the, the properties of the structure of space time changed during these phase transitions. And one of the predictions for one of these early theories is called the kibble zurich me mechanism, said that giant cosmic strings formed during these phase transitions and would separate these different types of domains. Um, so we looked at these, these materials that are really interesting for microelectronics now um, to see if the theories that described these Big Bang theories could be applied to describe these pattern formation in, in these multiferroic materials is the name. Um, and it, it worked. So we predicted that the, the formation of, of these patterns could be described using the formation of cosmic strings in the early universe. Wow. Um, so not, not exactly um, applied to, <laughs> to this problem of energy reduction in microelectronics, but, but still um, really trying to understand the fundamental physics and chemistry of these types of systems. That's amazing that the that physics of things on the largest possible scales could relate to things on the smallest scales. Really interesting work. And so um, is that th those strings and those patterns in the early universe, um, is that why is that related to um, the theory of how the universe got um, basically clumpy and why there's some areas where there's stuff and some areas where there's nothing? Or is that something totally different? So this, these predictions of, of cosmic strings, they're called topological defects. That's the, the technical phrase for them. Um, actually, so we're able to look at the cosmic microwave background, right? So we're able to kind of visualize the constituents of, of the universe and see if there are any regions where we get matter or energy clumped together. So they've actually discounted much of the universe being comprised of these types of cosmic strings. But what we were able to do when we looked in this real material on Earth to check to see if the physics was correct. So even though this prediction had been made that these cosmic strings should form during the Big Bang, uh, no one had way, you, you couldn't rerun the universe, right? We can't rerun the Big Bang <laughs> to check to see if, if the physics is right. But what we can do is rerun the experiment on the material in the lab. And so that's what we're able to do is check that the physics was right and check that the equations held in, in a real system. And is this work ongoing or are you working on something different now? 
we have mostly well i have mostly finished up that work um but there's still a lot of open questions that i'm you know that are still um hanging out at the back of my brain on on that project mm -hmm. um one of the findings was that when you when you cool a material really really quickly uh, we get a different domain formation than what the theory would expect. Oh. And that's something we haven't been able to solve yet. So that's something that is still um, keeping me up at night sometimes and, and waking me mm. up in the middle of the night. But um, in general, that, that most of the work I've done on that is, is already out there and, and you can read about it. Wonderful. Um, so I think we don't have too much time left. So one thing I would love to cover kind of, uh, before we wrap up is... You know, you, you both have very interesting careers and you're both attacking problems from different perspectives that are very complementary. But I just wanted to hear a little bit about how you both came into your roles and sort of your personal course uh, as a scientist, how you got where you are today, and if there were any interesting or unexpected moments along the way. Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, this life was full of uh, Bollywood dance dramas and fight <laughs> sequences and unexpected twists and stuff. But in my <laughs> case, you know, I did my PhD here at Berkeley a long time ago, and I was going to stay here at LBL. I got this very strange offer. This is back in the late 80s from Bell. And uh, my advisor said, oh, I can't afford to pay you that much. So I went out to New Jersey. <laughs> it was a fantastic experience. We discovered many things. And then I went to Maryland, uh, University of Maryland for nine years, came back to Berkeley in 2004. But for sure, uh, I, can, I can see different break points or things that happened that dramatically changed how one of them was um, this discovery of something called colossal magnetoresistance. This was a project that we literally worked for seven days without sleeping. Hmm. And it was, it was a big discovery at that time, opened up a new field back in the early 90s. And uh, I remember this because I was one of the people growing the material. Uh, the second one was, of course, the, the material that Sinead was talking about, uh, we were doing something else. We were looking at other materials called ferroelectrics. These are like your kitchen magnet, but um, they are electrically that way, not magnetically. And so one of my colleagues was telling me about coupling between magnetism and electricity. And I said, yeah, I've heard of Maxwell's equations and stuff like that, but I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> but we, at that time, this was back in the late 1990s, we had stumbled onto a material which has this attribute that it has both magnetism and electricity, and you can manipulate the magnetism with an electric field. These are the multiferroics. Now, it turns out that I, I work very closely with Sinead's advisor, former advisor, Nicholas Falden, who did some of the early theoretical work with us when I was still back at Maryland. And so we've been at this uh, for a while, in the meantime, in between, I did a lot of other things. I went to DOE. I spent two years in the Department of Energy leading something called the SunChart Initiative. It was the, the entire solar program for the United States. Oh, wow. We had an amazing team of people there. Again, this works because you bring the right set of people together. We had Steve Chu, who was the energy secretary and stuff like that. Uh, but basically, uh, um, Sunchart defined how to bring the cost of solar down to a parity. And for me, it was an eye-opening experience because that was the first time that I had seen research at the macroscopic level, meaning, uh, and this is now a very key underpinning for my own research, where you can take a macroscopic global problem, something which is at the trillions of dollars in, in terms of markets, and you can cascade down all the way to fundamental physics. And so that was an amazing experience, uh, learning a lot. Then when I came back to LBL, uh, as an associate lab director for energy technologies, we use that idea. How do you make these connections? Now, they seem very far away, but if you make the connections, uh, something very special could happen. And so that's been my, my learning pathway. So I actually was originally going to go to art school. So I started <laughs> off in a complete... <laughs> I started off completely on the wrong track, I guess. And 
my my art teacher said, you know, you should probably do physics. And I don't know if he if he was being um, entirely uh, uh, nice about that when he said you should be a physicist rather than an artist. Um, but but uh, I, I, I actually originally was going to be a string theorist. I thought I wanted to do high energy physics. And I ended up, uh, I, I grew up in Ireland, in Dublin, and I went to, to university in Trinity College, Dublin. And I got really lucky that I got an internship in UC Santa Barbara when I was in my third year. And I chose UC Santa Barbara for the internship because it, it, it was a lot warmer and there was a beach nearby and we don't have, <laughs> we don't have weather like that in Ireland. Uh, but the other lucky thing about that was I got to work with um, uh, a professor there who's a professor um, at, in Santa Barbara at the time, which is Nicholas Falden. Uh, and that was pretty pivotal in my in my career in, in one in convincing me that solid state physics research was really where the interesting problems that I was interested in were. Um, and also uh, Nicola ended up being my, my PhD advisor later on as well. Um, and I don't I don't think Ramesh remembers this at all. But when I was when I was visiting UC Santa Barbara, I, I actually came up to Berkeley one day and visited. I remember his lab. that vividly. <laughs> Um, as as an undergraduate, so yeah, that's uh, correct. Yeah. I was I was uh, there. There was several factors at play for me ending up in in this type of uh, research direction. Yeah, but um, you know, in some sense, physics is one of the the most beautiful manifestations of art, right? I mean, if you can reach deep into yourself and use the principles of physics, you know, these these boundaries between music and physics and art, you know, Mozart was a mathematician in some sense, right? So these boundaries actually become very fuzzy. And that's perhaps the most fun part of doing science, that you can look at perspectives well beyond what you're taught in your classes. Yeah, every physicist I've talked to is basically also part philosopher so it's a yeah, good of course <laughs> it's a good domain for those, yeah, that's those right. yeah. people of course it's free so you can philosophize about anything else but uh, <laughs> but i think physics is a way to ponder the universe you know i'm learning physics in my own case i was not trained as a physicist i was trained as a material science person i'm actually going slowly backwards into physics i figured by the time i'm all done i would have figured out some parts of physics you know which is a, <laughs> uh, just a beautiful field thank you shanae and ramesh for being here again and for talking with me about microelectronics today yeah it's been a pleasure alia uh, of course i talk to shanae very often because we collaborate on many projects but this has been a pleasure to be able to have this fireside chat podcast mm -hmm. uh, with you leading us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Julia. It was it was it was an honor and a privilege to tell you about the work we're doing at, at LBL, and I look forward to hearing the podcast. Thanks for listening to A Day in the Half-Life on your microelectronics-based device. See you next time. <laughs>